I guess I, I would consider that I come to the discussion about housing, certainly from the perspective of being a landscape architect. Um, and I think also from being um, involved over the last couple of years um, of building a faculty concerned with land, food, and community. And I think those three concepts actually intertwine and are at, in fact, the basis of most of life. And certainly um, housing being a, an important part of that. So I think that I've always felt that the landscape, especially the urban landscape, is one that should be owned and, um, if you will, managed by the citizens. So that's a kind of a, a first premise. Now, that's a tough premise to always follow up on because there's a, obviously um, ups and downs in communities in terms of energy that a, a citizen might have to put into what I'd call the, the, the urban landscape. But I think the bottom line is that um, as, we, as we look at growing, um, what I like to think of is, is uh, urban villages in a city like the city of Vancouver, housing is a big part of that. And I think if we can step back and say, as we think about where we want to live, what are the attributes? And if we, and I'll even go, you know, I'll even go back to city plan, which I don't know what year city plan was, but 95, it, 95, it had some, I think, really good processes, um, the, the, the city circles. Yeah. Yeah. that really brought people together and in fact I used that same methodology here in the faculty in, in as we were trying to uh, determine our, our vision. So I think that by involving people in the whole planning process for the city we all get more aware of what is of concern to us and what makes a neighborhood and and then when developments occur I think the grounding is there yeah. and the understanding is there of what's important about this neighborhood. Why do I like it so much? How do I read the landscape? Uh, how do I read it from the point of view of what's been designed? But also how do I read its culture? And how do I make sure then by to have some criteria that when I'm looking at a change to my landscape that I can either say to myself, yeah, I can see how this change could be constructed in a way that would add to my neighborhood, or it could be in, in direct opposition. Well, I think the, the housing challenges in Vancouver have, have in a sense always been about scale. Um, you know, we've got this really vibrant and quite high density downtown core where unusually and wonderfully, in many senses, we've got communities that, that interact and are downtown. And then we pretty quickly move to a single family kind of a, of a landscape. So I think the big challenge has always been, and at least it, we identified it in the, um, our urban landscape task force from way back in 1992, was, you know, how do you deal with, uh, actually, uh, gently densifying um, a single-family neighborhood when when people are very used to and and happy to have um, a lot of space and and a lot of a private landscape surrounding them. So I think the challenge is to come to grips with as we grow our communities and you know of course the the, the easy way of understanding that is do you want your children to be able to live here? And if so, then we have to think a little bit differently about how we're all going to going to live. Um, and and then I think you can actually begin to get excited about turning that challenge into into an opportunity that begins to look not just at okay, this means we've got to now have uh, high rises in our neighborhood, or okay, this means that you know we have to densify. Um, quickly and immediately and, and powerfully, I think it means that we need to think about a, a number of different strategies. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for me, the challenge is thinking, all of us thinking creatively, citizens thinking creatively, decision makers thinking creatively, and, and our professionals in the city of Vancouver thinking creatively.
Why, uh, why do you think density uh, needs to go up? Or, I mean, do you think that's bound to happen? Or um, what are the forces that are driving the increase in density in the hmm. city? Well, I guess I might, might, maybe I'm naive, but I like to think that, I mean, the, the forces for me are to make an urban life more exciting. And, you know, this isn't a very popular view, but I actually think we don't have enough people in the city of Vancouver. That, that in fact, to make our transit system work well, to really be a sustainable urban community, there, there actually aren't enough of us in, um, in close proximity so that our public, we can invest in our public realm and we can have wonderful public living rooms for us to, to be in. I mean, we don't have really a decent gathering place in the city of Vancouver. I mean, we're all into movement. We, you know, we, I think we've got some of our Greenway public way and our bike ways and, you know, we can move through our communities a little better than we could. But we're, we're not great at creating places where we can be and where, you know, you can go as an individual and, you know, you don't have to know everybody, but you can kind of feel part of, uh, of a community. And I think if we want to age in place, there's another good reason. You know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be 80 years old and have to give up my car and my independence because that's something that has been, you know, so much part of my life. I want to be in a situation where walking is really where I'm at. And so I, I much more gracefully, you know, ease into um, another way of being. And so that's it's essential for us to think about new ways of housing ourselves. So you're talking about uh, uh, the vision. Well, you, you, you've got points of the vision for the next 20 years. I mean, so 20 years from now or 50 years from now, what, uh, like, what would be... If, if we were able to solve problems now, what would it look like uh, 20 years from now that you think would be more, that would be better for the city? For mm -hmm. Well, I guess when I when I try to imagine out to that, you know, out that far, I can't help but the the word that comes to most to mind is diversity in everything, choices and. For me, a really strong, what I'll call, public realm structure that we respond to. So that, you know, I don't know whether people realize that, you know, at least almost a half of the city of Vancouver is actually owned by the public. When you add parks, streets, a third of our land is streets, school grounds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so my vision of the future is that we've got our public realm act together and in fact each of those pieces are incredibly um, connected to community and to community building and that those pieces inform that structure, that framework, that backbone, however you want to call it, informs the private realm and informs it in such a way that we've got built in these public living rooms. We've got built in what I'll call the public backyard so that we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that all of our parks may not be the kind of pristine, uh, don't touch kind of parks. I mean, we've started that process by allowing community gardens to be part of our vocabulary and our typology of, of the urban landscape. Why not think ahead to thinking, okay, maybe we're all not going to be able to when we're 75 or 80 or now even 100. We're not going to maybe want to keep up our backyard or even have the capacity to do so. But we still want to engage the land. I mean, why is this a city of gardens? It's because people want to engage the land. Yeah. So um, uh, this, uh, these public living rooms uh, in basically inform our sense of, of community. You know? What sort of specific example? What do you mean by a public living room? Can you point to one? Uh, well, I guess I. Works, yeah, yeah. And all this public space, you're talking about streets and parks and everything. Show me a, a corner or a neighborhood that you can do. Well, I, I think I'm going to go to the neighborhood that I happen to live in right now and that um, while it's not perfect, 
um, is starting to have this kind of um, environment, and it's the Arbutus, what, what, what we call the Arbutus lands when they were being developed, and there was a huge foo for all around, you know, should we be four stories or could we go more? And, and in fact, when I look at it critically now, I think we could have easily have gone slightly more, um, but that's a, that's another story. So the greenway that connects Connaught Park up to Arbutus and has a bit of a crossroad at U Street um, is, I think, the beginnings of what I would call the public living room. Um, in when you go, when you walk through, and I, I don't tend to walk down the Greenway. I tend to walk more through on U Street. There's this amazing kind of group of people, um, parents, dogs, kids, that they hang out there, and to me. That's, and I think some of them probably live in the single family houses just a block away, and some of them may live in the, in the uh, community right around the Greenway. But that I think is the beginning of a successful space. But I would go farther and say, you know, we, we didn't go far enough. We should, there should be a community garden there, um, there should be a children's garden there, and it should be connected to the Kitts Community Center. Because I think that's one of the ways that we can actually extend the inside programming outside to be the public living room. So the programmatic challenges of a landscape that isn't maybe looked after connect back to the Kitts Community Center. So, that, so that's an example in my neighborhood of a, of a kind of place that's beginning to work, and it's helped by Arbutus. I mean, gradually Arbutus is, is getting to be a place that's a walkable street. It's got places to go to. Yeah, so the impact of this development on the surrounding neighborhood, how, how would you, it has changed Arbutus. I mean, it's certainly very busy. It's a lot busier now. There's a lot more cars parking along the way. Yep. It's slower to get through. Yep. Uh, what the impact of this kind of development on the surrounding neighborhood, I mean, has it been beneficial or are there problems? Or? Well, I guess my sense is that there's been a number of uh, strategies to minimize the negative, quote unquote, impact of a new development on an existing neighborhood. And one of them is, is the simple slowing down of traffic by, by using the traffic circles. I mean, they've, they've become an opportunity for people to actually do some community planting. And some of them are pretty fabulous, the people that take ownership over them. And, you know, it's been a relatively simple way of, uh, of slowing the traffic down. I would, um, I would argue that a lot of the, um, the new development and new people in the neighborhood have brought services to the older neighborhood because, you know, we, we didn't have La Petite France. We didn't have and unfortunately, we still don't have a little corner grocery, but that, that's got to be high up on the list. Um, so, you know, I think that that having um, more people in a neighborhood allows services to be closer to people so they don't have to get in their car and they can, you know, we can begin decreasing the number of car trips that we do every day for, you know, kind of more daily uh, shopping. Do you think people's concern about uh, about parking and traffic has been uh, somewhat mitigated by the fact that it really is a walking neighborhood, the Arbutus lands that you're talking about? Well, I, you know, I think that I think that's part of it. Um, you know, I don't know that we're all the way way there yet, but I know a lot more people that are using the car co-op. Um, people like Dave and I. We, we got rid of our car just because it, and I didn't realize that a car not being used is worse than one not being, <laughs> being maintained. And so, you know, we don't need it. And so I think there's more and more of, of that kind of feeling as we get more services close to us and as, as the transit improves. I mean, it all, it's not a one shot thing. I think we have to look at the landscape as this incredible in, in web and, and, and integrated pieces. And if we only invest in transit and we don't invest in the public realm or we don't invest in a diversity of housing types and we don't think ahead to, you know, how are we going to live when we're all 80? <laughs> you know, how is that really going to work? And should we be thinking about it now in terms of walkable districts? You know, I, it just, it makes sense. But human beings, we're... We're not always great on being able to forecast ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, uh, so that's the Arbutus land, and that's uh, that's, so that's a kind of a neighborhood. A neighborhood. What, is there another public living room that, uh, or a um, well, I dynamic mean, dynamic space such as the where you think the city needs to to become, or grow into? Well, I I think that. Um, yeah, there's no way you can say that too, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's some potential spaces that we haven't actually uh, engaged. And, and one of them that I've actually heard people talking about recently is the space in front of the art gallery. Um, that, you know, what an opportunity for perhaps investing in, in a public space that... And we use it now for protests and for, well, you know... It's not a great place to it's, No, it's a horrible... It's, you have to work around... Uh, <laughs> no, no place for it. <laughs> There's a perfect comment. <laughs> Let's keep that one in. <laughs> So, so, so anyway, the 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 whole idea that that spaces like uh, the Vancouver the the front door of the Vancouver Art Gallery, uh, you know, could, the Georgia door, let's put it that way, could be developed. I think that um, the you know we've. We have actually invested in a pretty amazing park system here. There's no question about it. If you look at Stanley Park and you look at Queen Elizabeth Park and you look at our, uh, you know, you look at the map of the city of Vancouver. So the idea of these greenways connecting them has been, in fact, that to provide more access to the parks. I would still like to bring more balance, what I call more balance, to the park system by increasing the degree of roughness and environmental integrity and manipulability, if you will. So places where people can actually say, you know, I actually go to this park um, and I can go to it because I'm a bird watcher and that's an important activity for me and it's just as important as the people that need to play soccer or rugby or whatever so I'm not saying no you can't play soccer and rugby I'm just saying maybe some of our parks could be um, diversified in terms of landscape and that that is actually part of thinking about ways to make the housing relationship, if you will, a more exciting one. And so if there's a diversity of public spaces and recreation and different types of recreation, then a greater density of housing is perhaps um, more acceptable or balanced by, by having that more, the richness of the public realm. Because I think if we, if we don't invest in the public realm and at the same time we keep developing the private realm, it's out of whack. I guess one of the messages that's important to me is the particularness of every landscape in, in Vancouver. And if, if we're going to be in an industrial neighborhood, then let's not sanitize it. It has to be safe. Uh, it's, I, I, I want to draw that distinction. But it, it seems to me to be most important into the future that we read that landscape carefully and that whatever the housing development, the public realm development, the street development, everything that goes into that particular neighborhood has that sensibility about it. And, you know, I, this is my endless message out here at UBC, that as we build a university town, we better know that we're at UBC. We better know that the programmatic ideas, the, the, the way the place feels, um, what happens here, that it's a university community. It's a fabulous university community. It's the, intel it's the intellectual community center of the region. So let's build it that way. Same thing if we're in False Creek Flats. Then let's not forget what they were and what they still are and how what an incredibly exciting landscape it is. So. I think that if, if a development is being proposed in a neighborhood, one of the first things we have to look at is, 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 it, is it honoring the neighborhood and all its values and its cultural matrix? Excellent. I I'm just was going to finish on that too. Um, so if you're a citizen who's facing a development that's moving into the neighborhood, 
Um, what things should you be watching for and uh, uh, what things might you oppose, but what things might you really want to push for in, in these kind of livable neighborhoods that need to come to our city? What, what advice would you give to citizens? Well, I guess I think one piece of advice is to actually realize your power as a citizen. And by that I don't mean what I'll call, you might want to clip this out, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going down. I, I don't want to be, I don't think citizens should be whining citizens. <laughs> I think we have to find um, a way for as citizens to realize your power and to insist on a transparent process for developing your community. I think that's that's one of the, the kind of rights and, and responsibilities of, of citizenship. Um, so based on a good transparent process, then I think there's, I think you have to, to a certain extent, listen to your heart in terms of reading the soul of your community, how it's, how it's built, um, what its history is, and, and also what your aspirations are for it in the future. But this has to be in the context of understanding that I don't think no growth is an option here. We want to age in place, we want places for our children, and in fact, we want to build a really vibrant community. And I think that happens around an openness to think about change. And, you know, we live in a world of change now, and it's tough for us, but I think that if, if you can start at that place, then I think that we can achieve a lot in terms of, of citizens being directly involved with the shaping of their own landscape. I think, I mean, we're, we're facing this at, at UBC as we've been critiquing the process that, that has been in place for, for building this community. And it seems that one of the places where we falter is in not being clear enough about um, setting the boundaries of the process, like what is what is possible and what isn't possible. Um, and I think that designing the process and therefore beginning with a clear set of uh, terms of reference can avoid a lot of ex it's, it's expectation management on all of our parts because we do have, um, like it or not, um, zoning issues, we have economic issues, well we have sustainability issues, don't we? I mean all the different criteria. So I think if the process starts with some really clear and joint stakeholder understanding of what, what that, what Patrick Connor would call the design brief, you know, so that you really understand where you're starting, then I think some of the communication breakdown that occurs through a lot of these processes can be avoided. But, you know, bottom line, it's all of us making trade-offs, and that's tough for us to do. So I think the more we can communicate about what the trade-offs are and move through a process that where the communication is free-flowing, the better off we are. The other pitch I'll put in here um, is for a much greater attention being paid to continuing education for both our decision makers and our professionals at City Hall. And that means that we as citizens may need to make some investment in that. Um, I think it's pretty unfair to expect um, our colleagues at City Hall to be up to date on everything when we don't have the support to send them to um, keep up with what's going on globally. That's one thing. Secondly, you know, these fabulous people that, that donate their time, because basically we don't pay them all that much as counselors, uh, they too should um, be able to avail themselves of some, some excellent um, education in terms of everything we've been talking about around housing, around you know, public process. And, and you know, maybe not surprising that someone like me would say it all comes back to education. And, and it comes back to um, a kind of a leadership literacy around what, what we need to know in order to make good decisions. And, and so I think if we, if we all kind of um, 
have a vocabulary that we can share, it, it makes the process a lot easier. And I think right now we, we falter on the shores of miscommunication, partly because we all have our own understanding of what words mean.